Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Um, I am Angela Jap. I'll be starting the, the presentation very shortly. We're just letting people in as we go along. Uh, if you can bear with us for a minute or two, and then we'll start for this evening's exchange talk. Um, if you can just take heed of the slides on the screen. So basically, today's session will be recorded. So if you don't want to appear in the recording, please make sure that your camera is off and ensure that you're on mute at all times just to stop any feedback coming on to us. Um, so we'll start in a couple of minutes' time. Nicola, do you want to also help admit in case anybody comes in a wee bit late? Yeah, I'll do that. I'm keeping an eye on that and I will do continue to, Angela. Super, thank you very much. Okay, we've got a lot to get through this, this evening. So what we'll do is we'll make a wee start. Um, so... Uh, hello and welcome to a very special exchange event. It's the very first collaboration between the RCS Exchange and the Scottish Educational Research Association. My name is Angela Jap, and I'm with you tonight with two hats on. Firstly, I'm a member of staff in the Education Department at the Conservatoire, but I'm also the Vice President of CIRA. In addition to our presenters, who I'll introduce shortly, I'm also joined by my CIRA colleague and the current President, Nicola Kars, and we're both delighted to see so many people here this evening, so we thank you very much for your time. Tonight's Exchange Connects event is all about creative well-being. In education, particularly with COVID, well-being is at the forefront of many people's minds. Tonight's event highlights the power and the value of the creative arts and promotes well-being throughout lifelong learning. With this in mind, I'm delighted to welcome our presenters who will each showcase and cast a light on their creative arts projects fostered and how it fostered well-being for the participants. So first of all, we have Dr. Brianna Robertson-Kirtland who will look at Singing for Health. We'll then have Dr. Bethany Whiteside to look at a dementia-friendly project in France, and we'll tie up this evening's proceedings with Dr. Rachel Drury, who'll look at a project called Kuri Dune and its many iterations. Each presenter will be given roughly 10 minutes to share their creative wellbeing project. We do welcome questions. The CIRA Connects events are all about questions and stimulating discussion. So we do welcome the questions, but we plan to keep the evening moving by having these at the end. So that if there's a particular thought, a comment or a question that you have, please feel free to put it into the chat box and we'll pick up on these as we move across tonight. But we will pose the questions to the presenters at the very end. So thank you very much. And now I'll hand over to Brianna to start this evening's presentations. Uh, thank you, Angela. Uh, so before I begin, I just want to say uh, thank you so much to Angela and to Sarah for inviting me to come and speak with you all this evening. So in December 2020, my co-investigator Lisbeth Tipp, who is a clinical psychologist at the University of Edinburgh, and I were awarded a two-year networking grant from the Royal Society of Edinburgh to establish Scotland's Singing for Health Network. Many of you here might be wondering what Singing for Health actually is. And there are several Singing for Health groups all across Scotland. Some groups focus on specific health conditions such as lung health or Parkinson's or dementia, while others promote singing for general well-being. The groups are frequently led by a leader who uses singing games or fun repertoire to promote positivity and a sense of community but research has also shown that the act of singing done consistently has positive health benefits. In an article published by Liz Cooper in 2020 for the British Academy for Sound Therapy, Cooper discovered that singing alters the hormones and neurotransmitters that boost mood state and the immune system. We have also found that singing reduces stress, which is linked to so many health conditions. Our previous research shows that listening to positive music for more than five minutes a day can improve mood state and that engaging in music by singing or playing instruments is more effective than listening alone. 
So myself, Lisbeth, and our research assistant on the project, Sophie Boyd, is currently completing her PhD at the University of Glasgow, have all worked as Singing for Health practitioners. But this was not the real reason why we wanted to set up a network. The idea actually came about after we organised and attended the Spheres of Singing conference last year. The conference attracted over 400 registered attendees and dedicated a day of workshops to talk uh, of workshops and talks to singing for health and well-being. Throughout this day, a huge range of research and practice was showcased, followed by a keynote talk on the topic of singing on prescription by Professor Emeritus Grenville Hancocks. Practitioners and researchers attending the conference recognized the need to establish a network that could continue the many conversations raised at the conference and could also unite practitioners, researchers and health professionals who were doing work in a variety of areas, but were not necessarily aware of how their work interlinked. There are several organizations and charities providing Singing for Health services across Scotland, as well as many practitioners facilitating groups without organizational support. However, to date, there is no resource that shows the number of Singing for Health support services in Scotland. Now, this is a real issue because as we discovered at the conference, many of the Singing for Health practitioners often feel like they are working in isolation, unsure of how their practice fits in with current research, or if they're even attracting the people who would really benefit from attending their Singing for Health group. At the conference, many Singing for Health practitioners spoke about how they wanted to do more for their communities, but were unsure how to get the message or information about their group to teachers, key workers and medical practitioners. Immediately after the conference, the organizers set up an informal meeting to ask those who were in attendance what they would find most useful and the resounding message was twofold, more support from fellow practitioners, researchers and the community and more awareness about singing for health. So to fulfill this need, we proposed that Scotland's Singing for Health Network would provide a space for a diverse community of singing practitioners and researchers who specifically work on singing, for, singing and health to come together to share knowledge, ideas and practice and to open up avenues for communication between individuals and organisations. Our plan is to do this by holding monthly practitioner meetings where Singing for Health practitioners can share their experiences and any challenges with fellow practitioners, providing peer support for one another. Diana, can I just pause you there for a second? Your slides are going blank. Yes, I know, because I'm not showing anything. As long as it's intentional, that's absolutely fine. <laughs> it's intentional. Um, we are also going to hold three large scale workshops where we will invite practitioners, researchers and health workers to discuss and share ideas. The themes for the three workshops are as follows. Embedding singing for health research in practice, benefits, challenges and facing the future. Sharing practice, how to engage and work with different Singing for Health groups, and engaging health professionals in Singing for Health research and practice. We also aim to educate and inform health practitioners, key workers, and the wider community about current Singing for Health practice and how it can support their patients and those in the community who would benefit from attending a Singing for Health group. This directly maps on to the Scottish agenda for realistic medicine. Furthermore, by informing health practitioner key, key workers and white, the wider community in Scotland of the location, accessibility and impacts of Singing for Health groups, and by gaining further public awareness of the impacts of Singing for Health by disseminating research and practice, the network will work towards informing Scottish policy, policy making about what Grenville Hancocks and June Irons point to, singing on prescription. In doing so, the network will recognise the all-party parliamentary group on arts, health and wellbeing inquiry report, which was made in 2017, that concluded that arts can make an invaluable contribution to a healthy and health-creating society, and that policy should work towards creative activity being part of all our lives. How we plan to fulfil this part of the proposal is to digitally map the locations of Singing for Health groups in Scotland. 
as well as detailing the evidence-based practice in order for health practitioners and anyone else who's wanting to benefit from this kind of resource to be well informed about the local Singing for Health activities. The digital map will be hosted on the network's open access website and will provide the first comprehensive list of Singing for Health services in Scotland, which will be useful for individuals with a range of conditions and health professionals, such as nurses, GPs and link workers, will be able to see if there is a Singing for Health group in their area. Likewise, the map will be useful for teachers, carers and anyone in the community who knows someone that might benefit from attending a group but has no idea where to find a group or if it would even suit. The aim is to have a beta version of the map available by March 2022 with a fully functioning map available on our website by the end of the project in March 2023. We are really excited about the project and we are so grateful that the Royal Society of Edinburgh have granted us this opportunity to bring everyone together to learn more about singing for health and how it can benefit our communities. If you want to find out more about us, then please do follow us on our Twitter at Scott Sing Health, or you can email us at singing for health at rcs.ac.uk. Thank you all very much. Super, Brianna, thank you very much. Um, obviously, you mentioned out working in isolation. That's quite familiar for us this year. Um, yes. This now is, uh, we'll tie up your ideas and we'll move over to Bethany. So, Bethany, if you can bring up your slides, that would be terrific. So just while we're waiting on Bethany getting ready to start, remember you can add some comments, any thoughts or any questions that you'd like to pose to the presenters and we'll capture them at the end and share them so we can get your questions answered. So Bethany, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Angela. And I'm starting my, my stopwatch um, because I do get very enthusiastic about this topic. So I'm going to be talking today about some of the research that I've been conducting with the Scottish Valley and the presentation is titled Autonomy, Collaboration, Creativity and Dignity, evaluating a three-year dementia-friendly dance programme. Now, this thematic framework um, that's part of the title aligns both of the evaluation approach taken, the ethos and set of values adopted by Scottish Ballet across all of their engagement um, programmes, but also with uh, the findings that arose and how I interpreted and uncovered those findings. But for the purposes of this presentation, I'm just going to be looking at the process of undertaking the work. So a little bit about the programme. The overlaying of time to dance um, is to positively impact on the quality of life of dancers involved. Um, in line with all of Scottish Ballet's dance health programmes, it's dance and dancers centred and inspired by the repertoire performed by the company. It takes place with live music and there is a social time before and after class. However, for time to dance, um, there's also an intergenerational format. So you would have two or three generations of families dancing together and a much greater focus on body percussion, on rhythm, on um, uh, partnering work, on eye contact and on moments of sociability and less on use of imagery and um, abstract notions of performance, for example. So what did I do? The aim of the evaluation was to explore the narrative framework and efficacy of the Time to Dance program and the model of practice developed by the company, and to understand the social and emotional experiences of all groups of participants. So both uh, the dancers with dementia, but also carers and family members that perhaps danced with them. A mixed methods approach was adopted, and this is in line with dance health research. Um, uh, increasingly, we're seeing this, um, this mode of research undertaken. So I used the UCL Museum Wellbeing Measures Toolkit, both the questionnaire and the umbrella, which I'll look at in a bit more detail in a moment. These were administered every eight weeks during the first year of data collection, with 13 dancers participating in the former measure and nine in the latter, and also conducted semi-structured interviews and ethnographic interviews with all groups of participants, including the practitioners, the music and dance practitioners leading the sessions. The importance of in the moment became increasingly obvious as the evaluation um, progressed. So by in the moment, I mean what was shared with the dancer while we were partnering each other, while we were walking along the corridor, but also in the moment in terms of capturing the knowledge of the practitioners. What were they learning and implementing as the programme progressed? 
I've listed here a number of limitations and I won't go through all of them, but essentially they all relate to the fact that this was a real world program. This is not a controlled research study. So there were a number of variables that had to be met within the research, within the evaluation design and with how the evaluation was carried out. So I wanted to look a little bit at ethics because within much of the dance with dementia literature produced, the focus of course generally is always on findings and I wanted to look past the, um, I gained institutional approval and I gained informed consent, etc. So evaluation can be intrusive if not invasive and this work involved dancers who were deemed to be vulnerable to experiencing cognitive and or sensory challenges and I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the approaches um, that myself and Scottish Ballet took to, to really value the individuality of each dancer. The Scottish Ballet, the company, communicated with all dancers prior to them joining that there was an evaluation taking place. And because it was a long-term programme that was dropping, there was constant communication being, being sent out. And there was a lot of agility and a lot of flexibility involved. As the programme progressed, Scottish Ballet could also communicate to myself if, um, uh, if it was a gap where I hadn't been in, if new dancers had joined, and if they had particular needs that I should be aware of, so that I could then go in better prepared. Time and space was enormously important, so a lot of time was given to me uh, to, to speak to dancers individually, to, sp to speak to small groups of people, to talk about the evaluation. Um, modifying of spaces, so this relates more to the data collection, but where I sat with, with dancers with dementia and we had a, a wee conversation or an interview, we actually modified the interview space to replicate the social space. So we would have the same playlist of music playing, we would move cushions through so that physically the space um, felt, felt similar. And this is actually an idea of a Scottish ballet practitioner, it wasn't my, my own idea, and it did increase levels of um, comfortableness. So informed consent, um, designer forms and use of proxy consent, I, I won't speak to, but communicating the evaluation. So I undertook training um, that Scottish Brown invited me to that they were undertaking themselves. And uh, arts, arts and Minds, an arts organisation, which was led by Magdalena Schamberger at the time, um, spoke about how when you're sitting with an individual with dementia and you want to start a relationship, you want to start a connection, um, how, how, how to spark that. So she spoke about sitting closely to the individual, mirroring their body language. If they're swinging their foot, perhaps you also swing your foot. If they're moving their hands, you move your hands and you start a dialogue with, with your body with physical gesture. And then that might progress to eye contact and then that might progress to conversation. And this was an approach that I used um, quite often and, and modified how, how I felt a need to in the moment. So the rationale of using the UCL Museum of Being Measures toolkit, this was actually um, a toolkit that was designed um, with and for individuals with dementia. And I was very keen to use, to gain numerical data from measures that had been informed by people with dementia. And I'll, we'll look at that in a moment. Um, the importance of dancing together. So um, it felt very important for me to be a participant in the class. I danced with the, the individuals, I got to learn a little bit about them, about the personalities, their likes and their dislikes. Um, I also, of course, obtained a lot of valuable data this way because of that importance of in the moment. Trust and rapport was built. And I think there's often this appreciation of the researchers showing their own vulnerability. It can be quite scary to walk into a studio and to dance. So if you're giving something, then people can see and note and respect that. Um, use and presentation of data. So a lot of dance with dementia research, um, there's a concern with the voices of the dancers being cut out of that research. And I, I, I was keen to um, include direct quotes, but there was a concern about um, exactly how to use and present that data. Many of the dancers that I, I worked with would substitute one word for another, for example. So a direct quote would make little sense perhaps to a reader who wasn't aware of the individual dancer or the particular context, so how to present that data. Um, a lot of sensitive information was used and there was a, a need to um, make decisions where I disregarded or deleted certain data. And lastly, frequency of researcher presence. presence. So because I went in FE eight weeks um, and I, I realized that if dancers weren't present when I was present, then we would miss each other and I would lose the chance to build that relationship. 
So actually I went in three Sundays in a row every eight weeks. So I learned that in conducting this evaluation, it was actually more labor intensive and more of myself was needed to conduct it. So just a couple of words about these measures um, so you can see what it looked like. So this was the umbrella from the UCL Wellbeing well, Museum Wellbeing Measures Toolkit. And you can see the words and the colors and the gradients. So this is a measure that um, through a Likert scale, we cause intensity of emotion with one being not at all and five being extremely. And feedback from some of the dancers was that it was quite abstract. It's quite difficult to understand. Um, feedback also related to how people liked the words and they liked the color and they liked the tactile nature because it was cut out so people held the hexagon shape. Um, I found myself sometimes translating certain words when I was using the measures so enlightened sometimes became informed, absorbed sometimes became interested for example and on the back of the measure people could draw or write or note anything that they, they wanted me to know about and some incredibly interesting and valuable data uh, came to me through those means. Um, looking at the questionnaire, so I should have said that the umbrella was designed for dancers with, um, for individuals with more early onset dementia and the questionnaire for individuals with later stages of dementia. That, that's why I used both measures. So the questionnaire has a series of statements and they are looking to record the frequency of a particular emotion being felt. So you can see the statements laid out here. And what I found was that if I had asked a dancer a particular question relating to one of these things, um, perhaps we wouldn't have had a, um, a, a particularly rich or um, much of a two-way interaction. Whereas with the questionnaire, when I read out a statement, quite often that elicited a much richer, lengthier, more individual response. So you see the quote on the right, this is from the, the lovely Evie, which is a, of course a pseudonym. So in response to the statement, I felt safe and secure, she offered, I just love this class, I love it, I could sit down to anyone that I hadn't met before and talk to them and they would talk to me. That's what life is all about. I know if I was to turn ill, I would be looked after. And actually among the findings, this sense of feeling safe and secure was absolutely a dominant theme that, that ran throughout. This is my final slide. And although I haven't really presented any of the findings, um, I am going to talk a little bit about the contribution that the evaluation makes to the field because much of it is linked to evaluation design and approach. So it's very rare within the field of dance health, especially within the field of dance for dementia, for there to be long-term programs that are looked at. Most interventions are eight, 10 weeks, for example. And in the report itself, um, I actually adopted thematic approach for presenting the conclusion, looking at themes of trust, transitions and balance. So a lot of the data relates to trust building um, between dancers and family members, between dancers and practitioners, between practitioners and family members, and between everyone and the researcher. The theme of transitions relates to transitions between exercises within the studio, across exercises within the studio, transitioning between spaces, between the studio and the social space, between the social space and the interview space, and also coming into Scottish Ballet's headquarters. This was an external venue. The focus here is on personal experience, so it's not an evaluation that seeks to look at the symptoms of dementia so much, it wasn't looking to seek an understanding so much of impact or benefit. Um, the evaluation involved dancers experiencing varying stages and types of dementia. Much of the research looks at working with dancers with early onset dementia, so there's an, ex an exclusion of voices that we see within the literature. Uh, the evaluation, um, as mentioned, the classes took place at Scottish Ballet's headquarters, not a care home or hospital, and many evaluations that are in existence, even if they're run by a dance organisation, they are going to people's homes, they're going to the dancers rather than the dancers coming to them, and that really affected a sense of autonomy, became less about being brought along, and over time becoming more about choosing to come along, and that's an incredibly important distinction for an individual with dementia. Um, as mentioned, this evaluation, um, really the voices of the dance practitioners and the dancers are at the heart of the evaluation. They, they absolutely guide it. And those voices have historically been cut out of work um, of this nature. Looking at the approach taken, mixed methods, but purposefully using measures that were designed for and with and by individuals with dementia, which um, it is, is slightly unique within the field of dance with dementia. And 
The UCL Museum World Being Measures Toolkit is a cross art domain, but has never been used in dance before, to my knowledge, or over an 18 month period. And lastly, the evaluation has an explicit focus on the modular practice developed by Scottish Ballet. So much of the research we see, we know it's about dance activity, but we do not hear or read or see what the dance is, how people are moving, and what the format, what, what the format is, what the structure is, um, and what the kind of knowledge and wisdom of the practitioners and the dancers are. So that was explicit within the evaluation. Um, thank you so much for listening. And um, Angela, that was my final slide. Super, Bethany, thank you very much. So in the first presentation, we were hearing about how Brianna's project was really helping us, help, helping different practitioners across a variety of um, sectors come together. And your presentation here was very much about togetherness and dancing together from your own experience as a dancer and working with your participants in your project. So that then takes into our final presentation for this evening before we move into questions and comments. And that's with Rachel. So Rachel, are you ready to take over? Just getting ready with your slides. Yep, I hope so. Sorry, um, I'm just trying to pull up the right That's okay. uh, slide. So just give me a moment. No problem. So remember everybody, if you want to ask any questions, give any comments, as Mary has done in the, the chat box, please feel free to pop into the chat box and we'll pose them at the end. Sorry, I'm frantically trying to find where my slides have gone, having set them all up um, earlier. Just Fine. bear with me, apologies everybody. Sorted. There we go. Fingers crossed. Excellent. That's going to work. Um, I'll hand over to you, Rachel. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Apologies for the faffing around there of getting the slides together. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about a project called Curry Dune, um, which is um, a project set up by Chamber Music Scotland. Um, Basically, I'm going to try and cover three things in this talk. So first of all, an overview of what the project is and um, also the research in relation to health and well-being and where my practice is situated within that. And then um, the findings and the links with the research. So I thought it might be quite useful to start off with a definition of what Curry Dune is, um, just in case there's anybody in the audience that um, doesn't know. The definition really is to snuggle down or settle in. It's a lovely Scots term. Um, and it was made famous by uh, a miners song, traditional miners um, song called Curry Dune. So it was a, a songwriting project that um, is actually the brainchild of Paul Tracy from Chamber Music Scotland. And I think he's lurking somewhere in the Zoom room here tonight, evening Paul. Um, and I've had the pleasure of working with him on this since 2015. Um, so over the last kind of six years, we have developed the ideas and the project um, as we've gone along through various iterations. So essentially um, how it works is that we have a creative team of practitioners who will go into a, a setting, whether that's a therapeutic setting or otherwise, uh, mostly consisting of either a poet or a writer, um, musicians and a composer, although that's a slight misnomer um, because we're most definitely involved in an act of co-songwriting um, throughout this project. It's not that a composer goes in, listens to somebody's experience and then writes a song for them. It's very much about um, writing a song with them. So we work with the families to um, in creating the song, in writing it, both the lyrics and the music, um, and then recording it. So we want them to be part of as much of the process as they can um, and then performing it. And at the end of the day, they will get hopefully um, a song. So the task of writing a song can be quite um, overwhelming for the participants, um, particularly if it's something they've never really uh, engaged with before. So it often includes nods, the song itself often includes nods towards either parental or, or sibling musical preferences. Um, so there's potentially some nods towards um, some established songs in there as well, or we use a chord sequence or something that, um, that relates to a preference. Um, and that's a good starting point for the for the music. So the aims of Curry Dune are um, 
yeah, there's four of them really. Um, we've covered one of them already, which is to work collaboratively with parents and siblings or indeed guardians and caregivers um, to help them write a song for and or with their child, depending on the situation. Um, it's to allow the participants to make as many of the creative decisions regarding the song as possible. And that is absolutely crucial. Um, a crucial part of our approach is that it's co-songwriting. Um, I often uh, describe myself as being a kind of almost like a digital interface between the family and the song. Um, that should be the creative team's um, role in this project. It's to give the participants ownership over their song. Um, so as many of those decisions, as much of, of them, their personalities, their preferences um, should be in there as, as possible. Um, and also to provide a different kind of platform for the participants to, um, to kind of understand and explore their emotions and tell their stories and um, explore their narrative. So they are the approaches. Um, the aims of these of, of this particular project is not particularly or it's not necessarily therapeutic it's not focused on therapeutic aims but there are therapeutic outcomes to it and um, it's much more kind of creative in terms of the the aims and that's an important piece of context actually in terms of where this um where my practice in particular is situated so we have a back catalogue of um curry doom we have run this since uh, 2015 so there's been a fair few iterations as um as angela uh, pointed out so we had North Edinburgh Pregnancy Cafe in, in 2015, and actually Angela was one of the researchers that did a piece of evaluation for us on, on this. Um, it's run twice at Rachel House Children's Hospice, um, which is through an organization called CHAS. So that was 2017 and 2018. And it's worth saying that um, I have worked a day a week for them, continue to work a day a week for them um, for the last five years as their uh, music specialist. So I have a, a strong kind of working relationship with, um, with that host organization. We ran it at the neonatal intensive care unit um, at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital in 2019. And we were due to run it again um, last year, but for very obvious reasons that wasn't to be. Uh, and it's also run through Renfrewshire Council um, with a different creative team. So I've been involved in the first three um, host organisations that you see on the page there. If you want to know more about that, do visit Chamber Music Scotland website um, and all of the songs that we've, we've written um, across the whole of the projects um, are available on their SoundCloud page and the link is there if you want it. So onto the research stuff. Um, the, a lot of the research around songwriting is based on therapeutic songwriting, which is very heavily um, entrenched in music therapy. So if you have a look at the, the words on screen here, the process of creating, notating and or recording lyrics by the client or clients and therapist within a therapeutic setting, um, th they're very kind of clinical. So we're talking about clients and therapists and we're talking about addressing psychosocial, emotional, cognitive communication needs of the client. Um, as I said before, one of the distinctions between the work that we do and the work that is done in music therapy is that um, for us, the aims are artistic or creative. Uh, and within this kind of setting for music therapy, the aims are most definitely therapeutic. Um, it actually doesn't really matter what setting you're in. Um, it's much more about the aims um, in that respect. So I'm going to argue today that um, the what can happen in music therapy between a client and a, um, a therapist can also happen um, in a community music setting as well, um, where we're working with a facilitator and a participant. Um, the aims are slightly different. However, there are still therapeutic outcomes um, and impacts on health and well-being. I think probably at this point, it's also really important to say that um, or to consider that the even though there might be an impact on health and well-being, it's not always necessarily going to be a positive one. And that's something that we need to think very carefully about in terms of the ethics around the projects and what supports available. And it's crucial when we're doing partnership working with other organisations to make sure there is support networks in place, both for the participants and indeed for the creative team, um, which we can talk about a bit later if we have time. So my practice um, basically straddles the two areas, music therapy and community music. Uh, and we have an area now called community music therapy, which has started being articulated in the 90s, early 2000s. Um, and if you want some further reading, there's a couple of um, there's a couple of resources I've I put for you down in the corner of the screen there. Um, if you're interested to look further in that, it made me think when I was talking to Brianna and um, when Brianna and Beth were talking rather, um, that I wonder whether there's a crossover in terms of you know community dance therapy, for example. Um, it feels very much like the the three kind of approaches sit very much within therapeutic um, 
aims and settings. So um, on to some of the research findings, um, some of the research established research literature that's out there. Uh, we know that songs tell pe tells people stories. It's yeah, for a really useful uh, way of um, helping our participants, our families explore um, their own narrative, make sense of their life. I think there's something very profound that happens when you take that narrative and you put it through an artistic process. Um, and what you get at the end is um, can, can be really quite profound and quite moving. Um, we also know that it's a good way to express emotions um, and it's a way of expressing emotions that is different from just speaking about them. So it's just a different platform to do that. I'm really hoping that um, my computer will now share sound given the faffing about at the start. So I'm going to start, um, I'm going to give you a little excerpt of a song um, which was done with a family at Rachel House. Um, and if you can't hear this, Angela, you can just tell me and we'll move on to the next slide. <laughs> You hearing anything? Get up in the morning and put the kettle on. Make a cup of coffee and get the kids out of bed. There are arguments at breakfast about what they're gonna choose. And it's off to find five pairs of school shoes. Drop the kids at nursery and school. The usual busy traffic sets the So the approach that the family took um, on that song, as you can hear, is just basically a narration of a day. It's what happens, you know, in 24 hours of the life of that family. Um, and it's pretty chaotic, um, as you can hear. It's a little fellow who's got five siblings, hence the, um, the nod towards the five, find, trying to find five pairs of school shoes before you get the kids out the door in the morning. Um, but it's, it's a really lovely approach um, that was taken by that family to, um, to express their experience um, of life at that time. Um, another key aspect of the research findings is um, this idea of a sense of achievement having been gained from going through a songwriting process um, in this particular area. So it's this idea of um, increase of mastery and self-esteem and self-confidence. And this, come through, this has come through quite a lot actually in all of the evaluation and research that's, that we've done um, over the course of Curry Doom. Um, as I said before, I think this is also true, I would strongly argue this is also true for the creative team as well, working on the project. Um, there is an enormous sense of well-being uh, in amongst lots of other things um, that you get as, um, as an artist on, on this project as well, um, which is a really nice thing. So I'm going to give you just a couple of um, quotes from um, some of the evaluation that happened in the most recent iteration, which was at the neonatal intensive care unit. Uh, and we asked, what did you like about taking part in the project? Um, this was such an emotional and exciting experience. Something we look forward to helped us express emotions through good times and hard. Um, so you can see how that links very much with the established research that's in the field. Um, and I love the quote from the next family who said the project just captured the essence of my family, um, which is just an utterly lovely thing um, to hear back because that's the whole point. That's the whole point of this project. Um, I should say that this evaluation was conducted by Joan Burns, who is a psychologist um, working in the unit. Um, so she has given me permission to use that tonight. So um, thank you very much for that. Um, we'll move on to the next slide, which um, is one more piece of evaluation. And again, for me, this is um, this outlines the power of the arts for me. So um, this family have said these people are not nurses or doctors. Um, so to go in and have a chat about our son's situation in a stress-free environment and having every emotion and feeling listened to is amazing. Um, it's such, but I think the arts are such a powerful medium um, to work with when you are working in these kind of settings. Um, this is for me why um, it, I suppose this quote represents for me why art is all about being a human being. Um, because of course you're going to go in and of course you're going to listen and of course you're going to want to help and you're going to want to um, to write and be able to help that that family write a song for their um, for their son. So I'm going to leave you with um, the song actually, um, 
yeah, and I said at the start, there's often a nod towards musical preferences. So um, for anybody out there who fancies a challenge, you can tell me at the end um, what you've heard. Um, so I'll let this play while I um, show the last slide, which is thank you to all the people involved in Curridoon um, to date. Never seen a person so small You'd fit in the palm of a hand And we knew that there'd be struggles ahead So we picked you a name fit for a king When you got here, darling, I know You were our warrior Right from the start, from the very first day you got here, you stole our heart, and we just can't wait to take you home. Oh, darling, I know, I know, darling. The doctor said there's always one that proves you wrong. Just can't wait to take you home. That was a bit of an abrupt end to the song. Sorry about that. Um, anyway, I will finish there because um, we need to have time for questions. So thank you so much for listening. And I'll hand back over to Angela. Super, thank you very much, Rachel. And I also like the fact you posed us a question <laughs> in preparation for us posing your questions. So there were three very different, but at the same time interwoven uh, presentations from Brianna through to Bethany and ending with Rachel. All of them are very much, uh, as Rachel mentioned, their own presentation, profound and moving. And I would certainly say that's one of the, the key themes which are interlinking. Nicola, what we'll do is we'll hand over to you. So can you maybe summarize any comments or thoughts that are arising in the chat, even any questions that we can pose to the presenters? Yes, I can. Thanks, Angela. And um, thank you to all the presenters. I found that so interesting today. And I think one of the key points coming out in the chat, um, and thanks to Mary for sort of starting that off, and I responded as well, and um, is just emphasising the value of creative endeavours and the creative arts. And that um, I think you all spoke about that in your presentations. And then, you know, linking it in, because a number of us are from that, that kind of teaching and school background, it's just really sad that that does not seem to be following through in school context, particularly when we hear um, the presentations today and, and the value these um, aspects are having in people's lives. So I think that will come up a bit more in discussion, but there is a, a couple of questions I'd like to start with. Um, and Claire's put a couple of questions in the chat, which I think are really good to start us off. Um, so asking first of all about the singing for health and just thinking about um, how that has been able to operate in the past year as a result of COVID restrictions and obviously the COVID restrictions having uh, implications for health, mental health and other aspects and has that the, the singing for health managed to continue Brianna? Uh, so it's one of the biggest conversations that um that we and the practitioners have been having because um, there's a lot of challenges with uh, trying to continue a practice that um, doesn't lend itself to the online environment but having to find a way to make it work in an online environment. Sorry, my cat isn't trying to get in the way. Um, so a lot of our practitioners, they have been trying to continue weekly group meetings um, and that's uh, one of our practitioners, she spoke quite openly about how she's been working kind of uh, double double the amount of hours that she normally would to produce something uh, with her group. And how she's doing that is basically pre-recording a lot of tracks, sending that out to her group, getting them all to meet with one another, um, you know, trying to do singing games online that lends itself well to the lag that's built in on Zoom. Um, sometimes just doing kind of weekly meetings and uh, and quizzes and sessions just so that that feeling of community is continuing on. Others have found it a lot more challenging to continue on uh, on an online format because their their members 
simply don't have access to that kind of technology um, or they struggle to use the technology or they're not familiar or they're uncomfortable using it. So they've had a, a harder time trying to continue on. One of our conversations early on, um, earlier on this year actually was, uh, was there capacity for groups to be booking outdoor spaces so that when we started to move to uh, things opening up again that we could use an outdoor space instead. And that we found that that's actually really challenging when it comes to knowing who's allowed to book a space and what spaces are available. Um, so we've now posed that to, uh, I've posed it to my local councillor here in South Lan and I'm based in East Kilbride, so South Lanarkshire, um, with a bit of con bit, met with a bit of confusion of, well, you can just go and sing in an outdoor space. Why do you need permission? It's like, well, because it's singing and people not might not want the noise or might not understand what's going on. So, you know, is there any kind of guidance that can be provided? So that is still on the table. Um, and we're also at the moment uh, trying to put together a, a list of questions that we can pose at a local parliamentary meeting about what we can do when spaces can open up and how we um, ensure that the spaces are safe for everyone, that make sure that it's comfortable, but that we're still able to make music together. So all I can say is that a lot of things are up in the air, but that the fact that we're able to bring so many practitioners from around Scotland together to actually pose these questions and then to collate them and put them towards someone who might be able to give us answers is at least a first step. Thank you. Um, thanks, Brian. That's really interesting and interesting because I was going to ask that about are you using outdoor space? Are people meeting outside and singing? So um, I certainly would love to see, <laughs> see that in my neighbourhood. Uh, so <laughs> some singing, that thing that would cheer me up as well. So um, thank you for sharing that and thank you for talking us through that. Um, the second question was for Bethany. Um, and um, this was around um, the, the comment from Claire was that the, the research really seems to be making a difference to the older people concerned. And the question was, is it mainly female participants that are that were part that were dancers in, in the research you were undertaking? Um, thank you for asking, Claire. So interestingly, among the dancers with dementia, it's fairly equal between male dancers and female dancers, but not among the participants who come with them. So the carers and family members are in almost every case uh, female. So far more daughters and daughters-in-law than sons and sons-in-law. And uh, we see a difference between this uh, dementia-friendly programme and the Dance for Parkinson's programme, which Scottish Ballet also won in partnership with Dance Space, where the dancers with Parkinson's are almost evenly split between male and female, and also the generally spouses who attend and dance with them. And again, an almost even split between wives and husbands attending as well. So there's a definitely a marked, marked difference here. That's interesting. So is there is the two different um, groups accessing, is there, are you planning on maybe looking at that and looking at the reasons behind that? Is there plans for research? Sounds like a bit of a gap in the, in the research. Yeah, it's, um, it's something I want to look at more because my background is actually sociology of dance. So dance health research traditionally always, it looks at impact and, and effect and benefits. It doesn't generally concern itself with who the dancers are. And, and I really want to delve into who, who are the dancers, because if you have a better idea of who's being reached, then you have an understanding of who isn't being reached and perhaps the reasons behind that. So some of the feedback that I've gained through the evaluations for the interviews is um, there can be a real fear of dance. It can be a very scary thing to do to, to move your body, particularly for the male dancers, whether they are dancers with Parkinson's or whether they are husbands accompanying their wives who have Parkinson's. And, um, and I, I think there's a different relationship in existence when it's a marriage, for example, compared to when it's a familial relationship between a, a parent and a child, and particularly where there's geography involved, for example. So we see a lot of um, family members in the Time to Dance programme who can only accompany their parent every so often. It, it's, they can't make it part of a weekly routine to the same extent, and, and I think that affects. I also think it speaks to a wider conversation about who the caregivers are, of course. Um, I don't think anyone's probably that surprised to hear that um, in terms of who is accompanying the dancers with dementia, that it's almost always the women who are attending. 
yes, I would like to look at this in much more detail. Thank you. Very good question. <laughs> Thanks. Just before uh, there's one coming in in the chat now for um, Rachel. So this is going this is going quite well according to plan. <laughs> We've got had a question for each presenter so far. I did plan this. Um, so Rachel, can you talk a bit more about how you select or introduce arts practitioners um, to in the work that you're doing? Are there particular sensitivities, skills, approaches that need to be considered when working with the participants and what training and support is provided for your arts team? And that's from Annie. Thank you, Annie. Thanks, Annie. Yeah, great question and actually a really important one. Um, so the answer to that is yes, we do uh, choose our creative team very carefully. Um, it is, you can imagine that going into some of those environments, it's a very, very sensitive um, way to work. Um, and there needs to be a lot of support set up there. I think I, um, I now that my heartbeat is back to normal, having lost my slides at the start of that um, that presentation, um, I'll try and answer coherently. Um, yeah, so I, you hopefully you heard me say at the start that there were implications for health and well-being, both for the participants that we're working with as, as a result of the, um, the project itself, but also for the creative team. So in both of the therapeutic settings, so the children's hospice and neonatal intensive care units, um, we were working alongside and had access to counsellors and psychologists um, who would check in with us, um, depending on the, the structure of the project, um, on a fairly regular basis. And we would debrief at the end of the session and uh, we would do that as a creative team as well. So it, it very much feels like, although we have responsibility for the participants that we're working with in terms of health and wellbeing and making sure they're all right and there are support next networks, we also have responsibility for the creative team that we're working with and indeed we have responsibility for ourselves and um, so I know fine well when we do the one at Rachel House it's over the course of a week the other ones run over maybe eight weeks it's one you know a morning over the course of eight weeks or something like that but for the Rachel House one I, I have learned that I need to take the following week off because there's a lot to hold in the space whilst you're doing the project um, and you need time to be able to process that and um, to just yeah, sometimes just to be honest with you, sit and have a cry is what you need to do. Uh, and on every single project, every single member of the creative team has had a moment at some stage in the game that we and, you know, we've had to support our, each other through that. And that's that's only natural given the um, given the environments that we've been working in. So, yeah, we have to be very careful, actually, in terms of making sure there's enough support for everybody um, involved in the projects. Um, and that's that's not just the participants. I hope that answered your question. Thank you, Rachel. No, it did. And it, it's interesting to hear that that health and well-being on, on both aspects of the participants and the people engaging with, with them and thinking about that um, and the way you're talking about that and that, that therapeutic space, I guess, as well. And, and as you're saying, you're holding all of that and you, you need that space yourself. So really interesting. And thanks. A good question. Um, Angela. Conscious of the time, so we've got seven minutes left. And there's one question I'd like to pose to all three of you, and that's the way we'll tie up for this evening. So obviously, each of the projects you've got a very much a personal investment in from your, your backgrounds, from your, your interests, etc. But the one question I'm going to pose to each of you, and I'll ask each of you in turn to respond to be what do you feel having completed your project would you say is your most significant moment? So what would you say if you were to, to put your hat on something that you feel has been very important? What has been your significant moment in terms of in terms of your project so Brianna to you first what would you say is your significant moment uh, well our, our project is only just started so um so our most significant moment is probably yet to come um but so far it's definitely been bringing the practitioners together and hearing from them the challenges that they have faced not just during COVID, but uh, for a many, many number of years. And then what they feel that a network such as the Scotland Singing for Health Network could do for them um, and giving them a voice to actually vo voice some of the issues that they have experienced and how they can get the word for Singing for Health and the word for their groups out to the people that they really feel need to know about what they're doing and what they're up to. So that was the motivation behind getting the network grant. And that's what we hope that we're able to solidify going forward um, with this project. And hopefully by March 2023, we are able to fulfill our outcome of being able to have a voice that can inform policy. 
Super, and I like that idea that's yet to come. That's great. Bethany, what about yourself? I'm really glad you didn't ask me first because that is, that is a huge question, Angela. And just for the <laughs> audience's interest, Angela did not tell us that that was coming. <laughs> so, so it really is a in the moment response. Um, uh, I have I have two if that's okay. One is I was mentioning to Claire in the chat that one of the dancers, um, it's, it's all there's been a lot of public press, so I, I'm not um, I'm not contributing ethics, but she took her first dance class with Scottish Ballet at the age of 99 and um, and and announced that that it was never too late and turned 100 the following year and we basically threw a birthday party for her um after the after the class and there was a cake and lots of singing and it was just a remarkably wonderful um happy moment and then some tutus came out and people always get very excited when they see tutus and we got to handle costumes um of the ballet ballerinas wear and uh, and another dancer who was quite withdrawn um launched into a, a kind of lindy hop jive response and then one by one people joined in and that's the kind of interaction that you you can't necessarily plan you can't facilitate it has to come from the participants themselves and the second one is that approach that arts and arts uh, sorry um health and mind spoke about about commute how you can perhaps invite in into actual conversation somebody who is particularly withdrawn with the the later stages of dementia where you see how they're sitting, you replicate it. If they move slightly, you move slightly. And this realization that, that the dance, it's not just an activity, it really is a whole means of communication. And, and if I hadn't, if I hadn't known that, and if I hadn't been sort of brave enough to try it, um, I, I think the bravery of research is sometimes we don't talk about much, but sometimes it takes so much bravery to, to try new approaches and to try new ways of, of communicating and doing things, especially because you ultimately never want to upset anybody. And it can make it difficult sometimes then to, to, try, and, to try and be brave. Um, and uh, the first time I did that in the way that a dancer responded, um, and then over 18 months actually having the chance to cement a relationship with an individual um, felt very special. Um, I think dementia is something, it's a condition that almost everybody knows somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think uh, that could be a Sarah connection itself, bravery of research, so that might be something for the future then, Nicola. Thank you very much, Bethany. And last but not least, Rachel, your own thoughts. What would you say would be your significant moment from all the iterations I'm, that Curie doing? Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad that I came third in that, <laughs> that question for the reason that Beth outlined there as well. Um, it's so difficult. There's so many. Um, I, I think, like Beth, I'm going to choose two. I'll try and get through them quickly because I'm, I'm aware of time. The first one, um, we have what we call sharing events after every project where everybody comes back together. Um, after I've gone away and mastered all of the songs, everybody comes back together and we we literally share our songs with the with the community, with the rest of the, the team uh, and the families involved. And that is always such, such an emotional um, event. It is so powerful the um the impact of the arts when it comes to um that kind of setting and when it comes to uh, working in that way and i think that's a, a crucial reminder for me about just how impactful the arts can be um in that respect and again i think we need to find um better ways of trying to capture that in the research braver ways to use um beth's words so that's one of them the second one for me is the legacy of the song and how it's used um, so I'll give you two very quick examples. Um, there's a family that um, every time they visit Rachel House, I'm asked to sing their song. They, they request it um, as part of the music session. And that's a really, really, really lovely thing. Um, very personal to them. They go and get the instruments that they use on the track themselves, which is basically percussion instruments um, and play along with me. And that's, that's just a really lovely thing. Um, there's also been two occasions now, unfortunately, where um, or yeah, the song has been used at um, a child's funeral. And actually, I think that is, that's an incredibly personal, it's an incredibly, hopefully positive thing to be able to share at an event like that and to, um, and to hold and to move forward with, um, I hope. So that's kind of two, two ways in which the legacy of the song has, has been um, pretty impactful for, um, for individuals. But essentially, it's, it's the power of, of music in, in those settings never fails to astound me. Super, thank you very much. First of all, I want to say thank you very much for the three presenters. 
magnificent to kick off this very first collaborative event between the RCS and Fursira and for everyone for participating tonight, for coming along for the hour between six and seven, very much appreciated and we hope to see you again soon. So thank you very much. Take care and see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And thank